Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Palm Sunday service. In this season of Lent, we reflect on our journey of faith with Christ, remembering that long ago, God planted the tree of life, and yet it is on a tree that Christ was crucified. We are again reminded that life comes out of death, and we are promised that death does not have the final word. We light this candle on Palm Sunday, the last Sunday of Lent, remembering God's faithfulness through the cross upon, upon which our Lord was crucified, that death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for Christ triumphs over death. Please pray with me. As the days lengthen, dear God, may we remember that you are the one who calls our life out of death that you are the Lord of our lives. In the name of Christ, may we have the strength found in him to journey towards the cross. Amen. So as we start our worship this morning, we come to our call and Kathy will be leading the responses on your behalf this morning. And if you've got any palms, this is the time to be waving them. With cloaks and leaves laid in the road, let the people shout. Give thanks, thanks to, God to God for everlasting God. love. With arms stretching high to wave and to welcome, let the people shout. Open the gates of justice for this day. With voices raised up loud and uncontrolled, let the people shout. The stone that was rejected <clears throat> will be our yeah, salvation. salvation. Everlasting God, fling wide the gates. Come to us now in our time, for we need your salvation, your justice, your everlasting love. Come to yes, us now, now. We, welcome we welcome you. you. And now we come to a time of prayer. Gracious God, as we remember this day, how Jesus entered into Jerusalem to cries of celebration, help us to welcome him afresh into our hearts and lives. Accept the praise and worship we bring you and give us a real sense of expectation as we look towards his coming kingdom. Hosanna to the son of David, glory in the highest heaven. Gracious God, like your people long ago, we do not always see clearly. Our faith, shallow and self-centered, we do not understand as we should. Our praise, short-lived and superficial. But we ask, take the faith we offer, weak though it may be, and deepen it through this day so that we may truly welcome Christ and worship him with joyful praises now and always. Hosanna to the son of David, glory in the highest heaven, now and always. Amen. Amen. And now Kathy will lead us in the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory. 
forever and ever. ever. And ever. Amen. And our first reading this morning, Steve is bringing to us from the Good News Bible, from the book of Psalms. Give thanks to the Lord, because he is good, and his love is eternal. Let the people of Israel say, his love is eternal. Let the priests of God say, his love is eternal. Open to me the gates of the temple. I will go in and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. Only the righteous can come in. I praise you, Lord, because you heard me, because you have given me victory. The stone which the builders rejected as worthless turned out to be the most important of all. This was done by the Lord. What a wonderful sight it is. This is the day of the Lord's victory. Let us be happy. Let us celebrate. Save us, Lord. Save us. Give us success, O Lord. May God bless the one who comes in the name of the Lord. For the temple of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God. He has been good to us. With branches in your hands, start the festival and march around the altar. You are my God, and I give you thanks. I will pro proclaim your greatness. Give thanks to the Lord, because he is good, and his love is eternal. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We're now going to see a short video, which is about the donkey owner. And this was recorded by a URC minister based in the Southwest, Phil Nevard. And the reason I wanted to include this this week is our reading in a moment will come from John's gospel. And it's a little bit like Christmas. We amalgamate stories from the different gospels and create one whole, but in John, there is no scene where the disciples go to collect the donkey. The donkey just is. So I thought we would have some sort of interpretation of how the donkey came to be there. The donkey owner. I think we're having a way with my donkey. Two of them, bold as brass in broad daylight. Oi, you, get off me donkey. They looked at me, calm as you like, with smiles on their faces. The master needs it, they said. I racked my brain. The master? What master? Who's master? And then it came back to me. Ah, the deep, intense bloke who'd spoken to me a few weeks before. Out Jericho way. They must mean him. I've been going about my business. Ordinary day when I come across a crowd looking up into a tree. And there was a tiny bloke up there looking embarrassed and wishing the leaves would swallow him up. Some were laughing and pointing, but others were also watching a preacher guy who was shouting something up at the tree guy. The little guy climbs down and the crowd follows as seeing the preacher guy wander off to a house and disappear inside. The crowd started to disperse. But I got chatting with an olive seller who I had known from years back. And he said that the preacher guy, Jesus, had spotted the little guy, Zacchaeus, up the tree while he was preaching. Apparently, Zacchaeus was the local tax collector. Scum! Jesus had spoken to him and asked if he'd go round his house for tea. Zacchaeus had agreed and had half climbed, half fallen out the tree and set off for Jesus. And here we were. Well, we stood about and chatted about other stuff for a bit, and then out comes Zacchaeus, all in a flap. And he's promising to give away half of all of his possessions to the poor and pay back anyone he'd cheated. Four times over! Jesus comes out too, and he's smiling, and he shouts, Surely salvation has come to this house today! Well, as you can imagine, there's a bit of a scrum. Zagius gets mobbed by folk claiming to be poor and wanting his stash right now. And as the crowd's attention is distracted, Jesus picks me out, looks right at me and walks over. I'll be needing a donkey, he says. I understand you can help me. How 
And did he know? I don't have a rent-a-donkey hat. Oh, come to think of it, that's a very good idea. He didn't know me from Adam. I stammered and stuttered. Uh, when, what, what, ooh, what? I know, he said. And then he was gone. The master needs it. Of course, take her. She's all yours. Least I can do. Um, bye. The master needs it. The master needs it. The master needs me. Me? <laughs> wow. He needs me. And now we're going to hear that reading from John, which Elizabeth is going to bring to us. The reading is from John 12, verses 12 to 19. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the Passover festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Praise God! God bless him who comes in the name of the Lord. God bless the King of Israel. Jesus found a donkey and rode on it, just as the scripture says. Do not be afraid, city of Zion. Here comes your king, riding on a young donkey. His disciples did not understand this at the time. But when Jesus had been raised to glory, they remembered that the scripture said this about him and that they had done this for him. The people who had been with Jesus when he caught Lazarus out of the grave and raised him from death had reported what had happened. That was why the crowd met him, because they heard that he had performed this miracle. The Pharisees then said to one another, you see, we are not succeeding at all. Look, the whole world is following him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We come to our first hymn this morning, one which we associate so much with Palm Sunday, all glory, Lord and honour. It was lovely to see all the seeds during our chat at the beginning of the service because that was so much easier to see everyone's. And I wonder whether the seeds have met your expectations because over these five, six weeks, this is what's been happening. They've been slowly but surely emerging from the soil and growing into something we recognize 
and will bring hopefully some joy as we move forward into Easter. But have the seeds met your expectations? And I know for some of you, they've exceeded them. I mean, we, we've looked at these seeds and seen how much they've grown. And we know that we have some that we're happy with. But yesterday at um, our Beacon Hill coffee morning, we were talking about seeds because um, one of our members had grown seeds for the first time. And it was that sort of chance of thinking, well, what do I do next? And they don't always come through like Johnny's. And sometimes they do, and they don't meet your expectations. This is one sunflower, which has got a little, I don't know if you can see it, but it's got a little sort of falling over look. So that one hasn't come through how I expected it at all. It's not lovely and tall and straight as a sunflower might be. And this one is a surprise. I don't know if you can see it, because this is supposed to be a broad bean, according to the package. And I was a bit confused because to me, that looks like a runner bean. So you don't always get what you expect. And that's happened with some of our seeds as well. So we're going to follow through and think about that when we come to the reflection in a moment, because we all have expectations of other people, of our faith, of how we do things. And Palm Sunday is a really good Sunday to think about expectations. And of course, being Palm Sunday, I'm hoping that all of you have somewhere in your possession a palm cross. And I thought it'd be a really nice idea as we're not together, and I keep putting it in front of my face, I'm sorry about that, um, that we should bless these palms. So if you have one, please hold it up to the window and let us pray. With shouts of joy and jubilation, you entered your city, Jesus Lord Christ. With shouts of anger and hatred, you carried your cross to your death. With a cry, you breathed your last and bought us salvation and peace. May these palm crosses remind us that while our love may be like the morning mist that vanishes so early, yours remains constant and true. In this is our hope and confidence to stand before you, keep us faithful through times of trouble and peace. And may we rejoice in your eternity. Amen. So let us pause for a moment and prepare to hear the word in the way in which Jesus brings it to each of us individually. Like you, I have experienced many Palm Sundays over the years as I worshipped in different churches. I've participated in some Palm Sunday processions. I have watched my children, teary-eyed, process into church. I have been at a church where we gathered at the door and came into the church singing and waving palms. I have been at a church where the children in junior church excitedly came down the aisle waving their palms as the congregation sang all glory, Lord and honour. And then when the account of Jesus's entry was read from John, the children called out Hosanna at the top of their voices. It is a Sunday and a reading which calls us to be part of it to invite us back to the time of Jesus, to ask us to stand with the crowds and somehow recapture the moment, to help us experience the entry into Jerusalem as if we were there. And if we were, I wonder what our expectations would be. Where would we fit in? Our reading speaks of a large crowd that gathered to welcome Jesus at one of the gates into Jerusalem. A large crowd 
can you remember what it's that's like to be part of a crowd? It's no longer part of everyday experience, is it? Going to a football match, walking down Oxford Street in the Christmas shopping crowd, going to a concert. Last weekend, when I saw the news report on the Kill the Bill protest crowds, I felt as if it was a scene in a film, not real after a year of lockdown and social distancing. So the idea of being a crowd gathering on Palm Sunday is a true act of imagination for us at the moment. But if the protests at the weekend remind us of anything, it is that there are smaller groups or factions within a larger crowd who are there for different reasons, with different expectations, even if they too are waving palm branches. Jesus and the disciples were no strangers to crowds. They have been surrounded by large groups of people throughout their time together. Remember, there was a crowd around him when he delivered the Sermon on the Mount. He fed a crowd of 5,000 men besides women and children. As we heard in the donkey owner earlier, where Phil Nevar was cleverly linked the donkey owner to a crowd on the occasion when Jesus called Zacchaeus down from the sycamore tree because the short tax collector had climbed a sycamore tree to see Jesus over the heads of the crowd. There were definitely that day curious among the crowd who had seen Jesus preach, teach, heal, and perform many miracles over a three year period. They probably followed him on Palm Sunday because they wanted to know what he was going to do this time. Perhaps another miracle like the one they'd seen with the raising of Lazarus. Or would he notice them in the crowd as he had Zacchaeus? and honour them in some way. No doubt there were some who were confused about who Jesus was. They may not have had the chance to see him before and coming to Jerusalem for the Passover was the first chance they'd had to see this teacher, prophet or whoever he was. It's likely there were some who were zealots expecting from all they knew had seen and heard that at last, the political regime under Rome was going to be upset as a long awaited king was proclaimed. The donkey or colt was not just a symbol of humility. According to custom, a great leader wishing to show warlike intent would enter a city on a horse in full armor. But a king coming in peace would sometimes show this intent by riding a colt or a donkey. For those aware of this custom, Jesus's actions might be interpreted as, as accepting the title of king and therefore his coming might even be interpreted as a challenge to the established religious leadership and to Rome. After all, the route from the east gate to the temple went past the barracks and the Romans might react to this procession giving an opportunity to see the, what this Jesus was made of. We know the Pharisees were there too on the sidelines, opposing what he was doing, the warm reception of the crowds fueling their dismay. The Good News Bible really expresses the jealousy and frustration they felt. And of course, there were the disciples the committed followers over the years, there with Jesus and for Jesus, accepting the principles and values he had shared with them, possibly hoping and expecting that at last, this was a great day when all they had learned and done would be accepted and recognized. Little did they know how this week, that we call Holy Week 
would unfold. The disciples being confused is what it says. His disciples did not understand these things at first. And I don't blame them. Jesus was the king, but he came to Jerusalem on a donkey. Jesus was supposed to be the Messiah, but he talked about dying. How did it all fit together? All those people with different expectations. The crowd seems to be expecting something that is at odds with what Jesus will actually offer. I wonder how we would have reacted. What expectations do we have of Jesus, our faith? Would we wave and cheer at the one in the parade? simply as spectators, curious or confused as to who Jesus is? Or would we accept the challenge laid down by this extraordinary act of his and welcome him as the son of God, accept his humility, his message and values and stand by him, come what may, in this coming week, the man on the donkey awaits our response. Amen. So we come now to a time when we bring prayers of intercession to God. And as we recall Jesus entering Jerusalem, let us gather our thoughts to pray. Living God, as the crowds welcomed Jesus and sang your praises, we pray that many more will welcome you into their hearts and lives over the coming year. And we pray for opportunities to spread your good news and courage to take them. You are our God. We welcome you. Living God, we recall the donkey Jesus rode on, and we pray for that real humility in our hearts, which treats status and image casually, and truth and loving service seriously. You are our God. We welcome you. Living God, the crowds were responding to the healing love they had seen in action in Jesus. We bring to you, in our love and imaginations now, all those we would have brought to Jesus for healing and help. Give them comfort and reassurance, wholeness and hope. You are our God. We welcome you. Living God, Jesus knew he was riding to his death. We pray for all on that last journey, especially those burdened with fear and guilt. We commend to your eternal love all who have died, thanking you for the blessings we have received in knowing them. You are our God. We welcome you. Living God, we too spread palms on the road as we express our thankfulness for all you have done for us and the amazing extent of your love. Merciful Father. Accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. So our final hymn this morning is again another one we would expect to sing on Palm Sunday. 
And this is an interesting recording. It was done by a group of ministers, um, again in the Southwest Synod, which Phil has um, given us permission to use. And it includes Susan, Susan Derber, who's a very famous prayer writer and minister within the church. So I hope you enjoy this version of Ride On, Ride On in Majesty. come to the close of our service, let us pray. Gentle Christ, you set your face to Jerusalem, the place of trial, of torture and death, surrounded by noise, by expectation and by hope. Love unknown, vulnerability unrecognised. Gentle Christ, we will walk with you. We will weep with you. We will watch with you. Our eyes on you, our hearts with you, our lives for you, in humility, in awe, in peace. The blessings of this week will be extravagant, unexpected, transforming. The extravagant blessings of the one who remembers those who the world usually shun. The transforming blessing of the one who will tell of betrayal coming, but still shares his bread. The transforming blessing of the one who knows we will not always keep watch, but still call us his friends. The unexpected extravagant and transforming blessing of Christ, beaten and crucified, be ours this week and forever. Amen. <laughs> <laughs>